Hey everybody, welcome to today's video. Today we'll be covering uh, the differences between cognitive load theory and cognitive theory of multimedia learning, along with going over three different principles that we can use to help us design our lessons and teaching materials, along with the idea of using refutation in our teaching to help refute uh, maybe incorrect concepts that students have previously learned in the past. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and move along into our descriptions of cognitive load theory and cognitive theory of multimedia learning. The first of the theories that we'll be going over today is cognitive load theory. Now with cognitive load theory, we first want to go through kind of all the steps that take place when we're learning information. The first would be us bringing in information from our outside surroundings into our short-term short memory, which has a very limited capacity. That memory will then move into our working memory, which, like short-term, has a limited capacity. But inside this uh, working memory, we can bring up uh, information from our long-term long and integrate all this information together between what we're learning from the short-term and what we already know from the long-term. And this new integrated knowledge can then move back towards our long-term memory, uh, which has more of an indefinite storage. Now that we've discussed working memory and that it is a limited, has a limited capacity, we need to go over all the different uh, types of loads that go into working memory. The first would be intrinsic load. Intrinsic load is more or less the complexity of the information that we're teaching students. We can manage intrinsic load to a certain degree, uh, making con you know, going into the content more in depth, uh, making it easier, doing more scaffolding and things like that, spreading it out over multiple lessons. Uh, but more or less, uh, the intrinsic load is going to be what it is outside of some managing that we can do. Then we have extraneous load, which is the additional things that we put into our lessons. Um, sometimes we think that a relevant story might make this lesson fun and draw students in more. But what we're really doing is giving them more things to process. You know, extra unnecessary pictures, um, you know, extra stories, extra text. You know, the more that to do on top of what we're already teaching can really increase that extraneous load, which can overload our working memory. The last is uh, germane load, which is the idea of balancing our intrinsic load and our extraneous load. Um, intrinsic and extraneous are additive, which means them added together will be our total working memory. And with germane load, what we want to do is maximize our working memory so we don't really have so much empty space. This means what we want to do is manage that intrinsic load so we're not overloading kids with new content. And we want to reduce that extraneous load as much as possible so that we can teach them as much content as possible to fill up that working memory. Um, it's really what a germane uh, is, is managing that uh, intrinsic load while reducing that extraneous load as much as possible to kind of reach that threshold in our working memory. Our second theory is the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Uh, when we go over the cognitive theory of multimedia learning, we first need to go through the different learning channels. Now, you'll notice this is fairly similar to what cognitive load theory was. But the big focus of cognitive theory of multimedia learning is that we have dual channels of learning, or at least dual channels of bringing in out, uh, you know, information from our environments. The first being auditory information, and the second being visual information. All this information will come through our sensory memory, which is more or less unlimited, but things go in and out so quick that um, we don't really store anything in our visual memories. And then it goes on to our working memory where at this point things are becoming more like our cognitive load theory where our working memory does have a limited capacity inside our working memory we might store um, some verbal information as a visual as visual information some visual information that comes in we might even store as auditory information depending on how we organize that in our heads um, but just like with cognitive load theory we can bring uh, information from our long-term memory we can integrate this new information and old information together and then send it back to our long-term memory to be stored indefinitely. And again, that uh, the amount of information we can store in our long-term memory is potentially endless. In cognitive theory of multimedia learning, we have three processes we need to talk about in terms of uh, our cognitive load and our working memory. 
First would be extraneous processing, which sounds similar because it was one of the cognitive loads in the previous theory. Um, and it's very similar in that extraneous processing is kind of all the information that doesn't directly pertain to the lesson that we're teaching today or our instructional goal itself. It's those extra pictures, you know, the off the story that kind of pertains to the lesson, but not really. Um, and any type of extra activity or information that doesn't directly um, align with our instructional goal, that's going to fall underneath extraneous processing. And like with cognitive load theory, we want to minimize this extraneous processing as much as possible. The next would be essential processing, and this is all the processing, that, processing that's going to be directly related to our instructional goal. If we're teaching something, this is all this is the processing that we expect students to have towards learning whatever that is, uh, processing it, uh, and sending it on to a long-term memory. And the last one is gener generative processing. Uh, and the idea behind generative processes, processing is the motivation for students to learn the content. How do we motivate these students to want to learn? You know, are we doing things prior to the lesson or at the beginning of the lesson to help students understand why the content is important for them to learn? Are we creating an environment in which students are motivated to learn and, and pay attention to all those things? Because motivation does have a direct correlation to how much information students can take in through their working memory. And you know that motivation is going to have a direct result on what all goes into their long-term memory um, at the end of the day. Now we're going to go over three principles that we can use in our instructional design to help foster good working memory uh, in our lessons. The first would be the signaling property. The idea behind the signaling property is to use, um, for the most part, visual cues that help students understand exactly where the content is that we are talking about. This can be something like circling where we're at, using bolded words, using highlighting, anything like that to help draw a student's attention to where we want their attention to be. So they're not using any additional processing to think, hmm, I wonder where the teacher is right now. The next principle we'll cover is the redundancy principle. Now the redundancy principle is one that I personally do struggle with and I know a lot of other teachers struggle with as well. And this is not saying exactly what you have up on screen or not saying exactly what it is that you have in the notes. It is you put information up on the screen, normally like a very direct, this is the most important piece of information that I need you to see while we are up front discussing the content going into it more in depth. If all we're really going to do is say what's on the screen or say what's in the notes, then what we're doing is we're double, we're just repeating what students are reading and that's creating essentially a twice the amount of processing that students have to do. They should be able to either pay attention to what they're reading or pay attention to what teachers are saying. And if we're expecting them to do both for the same exact thing, we're just essentially doubling up the processing work they have to uh, complete. And our last principle is the coherence principle. And the idea behind the coherence principle is to keep things as simple as possible and to focus on what it is you're teaching and not including so much outside content that might not directly relate. This can be reducing the amount of pictures on a slide to maybe one picture. Um, instead of putting a whole paragraph up on a, of text up on a slide, cut it down to one or two sentences, cut it down to one or two definitions. Uh, making multiple slides instead of trying to shove everything into one slide can certainly help. And this just really helps cut down again on that extraneous uh, load processing that students have by having so much information shoved in their face at once that some of it's just gonna slip out. Whereas if we spread it out or we keep things more simple, uh, it's more likely that they'll be able to retain the information that we are putting in front of them. Now as a quick example to show you how these principles will work in practice, uh, I pulled up a slide from a, a narrative point of view lesson that I normally teach to my students. And let's see if you can identify the different principles that I'm using in this lesson and where I'm using them. All right, so now that we've talked about first person and second person narrative, we need to talk about third person narrative. In third person narrative, the identifying pronouns that are going to be used to help us identify what the point of view is, is he, she, they, and them. The reasoning behind this is in third person, the narrator is not a character in the story and therefore they cannot refer to themselves in the story. On top of that, the narrator is not talking directly to you, so they will not be referring to you as a character. 
Now, at any point in time, we notice that the narrator is using first person language or second person language, then the narration narrator is likely going to be a first person or second person narrator. The first type of third person uh, narration we'll cover is third person objective, because unlike first and second person, there are different types of third person narration. In a third person objective narration, the narrator is does not have any direct information on what a character is thinking or feeling. Like with a first person narrator, that narrator is a character in the story and can tell us what's going on in their head. In a third person objective narrator, they don't know what any of the characters are thinking and feeling, and we only learn information based off what we can see or hear. Now, can you identify where I use those three different principles on that slide? You'll notice that I use signaling to help identify where I wanted the student's attention to be by using red circling and boxes. You'll notice that I use the redundancy principle by not saying exactly what was up on the screen by further fleshing out the idea of that third person and third person objective while the key information was on the slide. And you'll notice that I use the coherence principle by keeping everything as simple as possible. I had one picture on the screen. I didn't have a lot of slides. I didn't have a theme in the background that might be distracting. The text was as easy to see as possible. And I did my best not to overload students. Now, the final thing we'll cover in today's video is refutation. The idea behind refutation is that over time, over the course of our lives and our students' lives, they'll learn information and we'll learn information that is more or less factually incorrect. Or maybe they learned it a certain way early on, because that is the easiest way to learn it. But we need to update that information going forward because things are changing now that we're going over more complicated content. In order to do this, we need to directly confront the misconceptions that students have when we're teaching a lesson. As an example, up on screen, I'll go over how to teach the order of operations to students who up to this point haven't had to use the order of operations. All right, everybody, today we're gonna to get into a new concept called the order of operations. Now, I know last year you solved multiple step equations up to three steps. But when you solve those equations, you either solve problems that only included addition or subtraction, or you only solve problems that included multiplication and division. And when you solve those problems, you solve them kind of like you read a sentence, right? When you read from left to right. However, things are changing now that we're getting into where we're at, where we're going to have to solve problems that, called, that include both addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and now moving forward, we cannot solve problems just by going left or right like we're used to. For example, let's look up on screen to this problem here. If we solve this problem the way that we normally do, we would likely get this answer. And it might shock you to find out that this answer is wrong. When we're working with the order of operations, we need to use something called PEMDAS up here on screen, where we're going to do things in a particular order. As you can see, the first two letter, or words up there, P stands for parentheses and E stands for exponents. And we're going to kind of ignore those two right now. We'll get into those at a later time. Right now, we're going to look at the multiplication division and the addition and subtraction. Again, normally we're used to solving everything left to right. If our problem starts with an addition, we would solve that addition first in the past. So if we have 6 plus 4 times 2, we would tip used to do the 6 plus 4 and then multiply it by 2. However, if we look at PEMDAS here, we're going to want to do that multiplication before we do that addition, even though it appears farther on the right of that problem. So let's look through this first equation up here. And let's see what stage we should start with. Can you identify it? It's right there. Good job. So as you can see, as I went through that problem, I first brought up students' previous misconceptions about how they solve a math equation by going left to right, similar to how they learned to read from left to right. I then explained why moving forward, um, we would not be solving equations like that anymore. And I went into a brief explanation on why we would not be solving problems from left to right anymore. Well, that's everything I had to go over with today. Thank you guys for stopping by and watching the video, and I hope you all have a good day. Bye.